manner. But let's look at how we actually implement it in OpenCV and Python. So I have our project directory structure pulled up here. We have this input image here. This is a 3D print of uh, various Pokemon if you ever played that game or watched that TV show as a kid. And our goal is we're going to be applying a bunch of convolutions to that input image and examining the output. So let's open our convolutions.py script and we'll start with our imports. So we'll be using scikit image here predominantly for its nice rescale intensity function. So when we apply convolution, our pixel intensity output ranges are going to be outside of the range 0 to 255. They could be negative, they could be positive, they could be large, they could be small. So we'll be working with a floating point data type. However, to visualize images with OpenCV, our pixel intensities have to be in the range 0 to 255, and they also have to be an unsigned 8-bit integer data type. So we have to do some conversions here. What's really nice about the rescale intensity function is that these conversions happen for us automatically. So that's why we import it. We have NumPy for numerical array processing, argparse for command line arguments, and then CV2 for OpenCV bindings. We then have this convolve function here. This is applies the given kernel to an input image and returns the output array. We grab the spatial dimensions of our input image and the spatial dimensions of our kernel. Now these three lines of code right here are really, really important because we have to pad our input image. When you apply convolution, by definition, you're actually going to decrease the size of your output image. So the reason applying padding is so important is imagine if we took this pixel zero and centered it on the 131, which we have to do in order to apply convolution. Well, what happens to the three values, the negative one, zero, and one that are sitting up here that don't have any image pixel values associated with them? And then what about the negative one here that are like sitting down here because they're hanging off the edge of the image? So you're like, huh, what do I do there? Well, there's a few situations. The first thing you could do is just not apply convolution where there is not valid room to be doing it. So actually the very first iteration of this kernel would actually sit right here. The zero value would actually be right here such that the negative one, negative two, and negative one sit here and the zero and the one sit here. If you do that though, then by definition of applying convolution, you're gonna lose the output of this column and the output of this row in your output matrix because there's not enough room to perform that convolution on the border pixels. There are a few ways to handle that. If you're training a, a deep neural network, you will apply what's called zero padding. So you'll just apply padding along the top row and atop this column here. Just put zeros in it. Just put zeros in it. Who cares? And that's it sounds like a hack, but that's really actually how you handle the problem of when your your tiny matrix kernel doesn't fit on top of your big matrix image because you need to place that centering. Another approach is what you call border replicate padding. And this is typically what you use when you're working with OpenCV and especially if your output image needs to be visualized by a reader. Because in, in deep learning, like who, no one is going to see the output image as it's going through the convolutional neural network. That's only for numerical processing. So we use that zero padding for efficiency and just because it works. Now, if that output image needed to be displayed to a user, then if you put that zero padding there, then you kind of create this weird little black border on the image, and then the output is kind of look a, would look a little weird and weird and funky, kind of like has this like grayish black border surrounding it. So what you do then is called replicate padding. So if I place the zero center of the kernel right here on this 131, then that means that this pixel, which otherwise wouldn't exist, would have a value of 131. This would have a value of 131. This would be 162, 232, 84, and then down here you'd have 104, 243, and 185. And you could continue expanding with that replication if you needed to. So we're going to use replicate padding here, which is the standard uh, if we want to visualize the output. So here we compute our padding size, which is the width of the kernel, minus 1, and then dividing by 2. And take a second now to convince yourself that is true. And then we call this copy make border on the image, passing in our padding values in the X and Y direction for essentially the left, the top, the right, and the bottom. So we're gonna use border replicate, which again will replicate these pixel, the pixel values along the borders such that this kernel can fit nicely and slide across and preserving the same output dimensions of our image. Here we initialize an empty output array with the same spatial dimensions of our output image. 
And then we're gonna perform the sliding window operation. We're gonna slide our kernel one pixel at a time across the entire image. And we're gonna start at the initial padding value, and then we're gonna slide across to the total number of uh, rows, and we'll loop over the total number of columns. From there, we extract the ROI using NumPy array slicing. So if we have a three by three kernel, and this ROI is also gonna be three pixels by three pixels. Again, this red block here, that's your tiny matrix, that's your kernel, that's hard coded. And here behind that kernel is the image pixel intensities. So that's what this ROI represents. It's the image pixel intensities in the background. Here's where we do the convolution. We take the element wise multiplication of the ROI and the kernel, sum those values together, and we store the output pixel value here in the output array. The final step is just a bit of rescaling so we can easily visualize the output. So we'll rescale the intensity of the output image and we'll ensure uh, all pixel values are in the range zero to one, which we then convert to zero to 255 using a simple multiplication and then convert the data type to an unsigned 8-bit integer. That output image is then returned to the calling function. Let's put this function to work for us. So we're now we're going to parse our command line arguments. We only need a single argument here, image, which is the path to our input image right here. And now we're gonna hand construct some kernels to apply to our image. So keep in mind, all kernels are m by n pixels. m and n can be equal to each other, but they have to be odd in order to have this notion of what a center pixel is. So here we're defining a seven by seven kernel filled with ones. It's a floating point data type because we're gonna be doing an average here. So seven by seven means there's 49 ones here, and we're gonna divide by 49, take one, divide by 49, and that's where our average is going to be. So this small blur is going to be examining seven by seven regions of the input image and averaging them together. We do the same thing here, only we're gonna use a larger blur. It's 21 by 21, so one is divided by 21 times 21 to create that larger blur area. We then have a number of filters here, and I'm not going to explain how these filters are derived. You're more than welcome to, to read any type of computer vision textbook. Uh, one of my favorites is it's a free book by uh, Richard Selesky. It's really, really detailed. It goes into a lot of the mathematic uh, derivations of these computer vision algorithms. It's a good read if you want to have a deeper understanding of the mathematics and a more maybe academic college motivated examples of computer vision. This isn't a code based book, so it's not your practical hands on implementation, but it's a really good book that you can go through if you want to understand a lot of the mathematical details surrounding computer vision and image processing. Refer to that book if you want to understand how these kernels are derived, but this kernel here is a sharpening kernel. It's going to enhance the detail of an image. This Laplacian is going to find edge-like regions inside the input image. You know the Sobel kernels here. We're going to compute the uh, Im image gradients across the x and y direction. And now that we have all these kernels defined, let's define a list of kernels with names. So each entry in this kernel bank is a list of a two tuple. So we have the name, which is a small blur, followed by the kernel itself. Here's a large blur, and here's the kernel associated with the large blur. Next step is let's apply each kernel in the kernel bank to our input image. So we load our input image from disk and convert it to grayscale. Since these kernel operators are meant to be applied to grayscale images. When you start working with deep learning models, you apply kernels to images of depth of three, and you'll start applying convolutions to the entire depth stack of a volume. So you'll be applying essentially kernels to uh, quote unquote images or volumes that have depths of like 64 or 128 or 256, you know, very, very large dimensions there. But for the time being, let's just understand how kernels work. So we're going to apply the kernel operation to a grayscale image. And we're going to loop over each of the images in the kernel bank, including the name of the kernel and the kernel itself. And to validate that our convolve function is working properly, we're going to compare its output to cv2.filter2d. This is the OpenCV's built-in function for applying kernels. So we'll apply the convolution function, passing in our grayscale image and our kernel. And we'll do the same thing to obtain our OpenCV output using the cv2.filter2d, inputting our gray, grayscale image through the entire depth of the image and then the kernel itself. And the last step then is just to show our output image, the output of our custom coded convolve function, 
and then OpenCV's output itself. Let's see the script in action. I grab the usage, come back to my terminal, and then I'm gonna execute the script. So here on the left is our input image. Here is the output of applying our custom coded convolve function. And here's the output of OpenCV's filter 2D function. They're the same, right? But take a look at the original input image and compare it to the outputs. Notice that we've blurred all the detail in this input image, and you can see the blurring result in the output image. That is accomplished by placing a seven by seven kernel and looping over the each and every input image pixel, one by one, left to right, top to bottom, and performing that element wise multiplication and sum and storing the output over here. Now let's look at a larger blur. Again, same output between our custom code and convolve function and OpenCV's CV2.filter2D. But now we're blurring over a 21 by 21 region of an input image. Our blurring is much more pronounced due to the fact that it's happening over a larger region. We can also apply a sharpening kernel. And here you'll see that the detail of this input image has been enhanced. So you can see a little bit more detail from the 3D printing. You can see a lot more detail on the hatching on the table itself. The Laplacian operator will perform a bit of edge detection like operations. So now you can see kind of a little bit of the outline of the, the 3D printed Pokemon, but mostly you get the outlines of the hatching on the table and some of the glasses here on the table itself. Now we'll compute our Sobel gradients across the X, X direction, which kind of gives us more of these vertical lines in the image. And we can also compute them across the Y axis, which will give us our horizontal lines that you can see here. And as you can see, again, our convolve function is matching the output of the CV2.filter 2D function. So we know we've implemented this method correctly. The big point I want you to draw from this is that first, implementing and using convolution is not that hard of a process. It's just taking a big matrix, your image, taking a kernel, sliding that left to right top to bottom across the entire image at each stop along the way you extract the region from the input image and you take the input region of the image do an element wise multiplication of that input image with your kernel sum all that out and store it in an output array that's all convolution or cross correlation is it's a very simple operation now the larger question then is just how do you define these kernels if you're doing traditional computer vision and image processing you just go read the OpenCV documentation. You read a traditional computer vision or image processing textbook. They'll show you how kernels can be derived to perform basic operations like blurring and sharpening and uh, edge detection, and gradient computation. The problem then is like, what about deep learning? Well, deep learning is automatically learning these filters. Deep learning doesn't have a textbook that is going and reading and hard coding these values. No, deep learning naturally learns these filter values in a hierarchy fashion. So when we stack them all together, we start learning these deeper and deeper and richer and richer features. But we're not quite there yet. You know, we, we have so much content on deep learning and deep learning 101 and 102 and all the other deep learning courses inside Pi Mysteries University. But it, all of this hinges on you just understanding the fundamentals of, of convolution. And I hope after going through this tutorial, you'll see that convolution is not that complicated of a process. Deep learning just applies it in a more novel way that automatically learns these filters for us. So make sure you go through the code with this tutorial. Make sure you work through the Jupyter notebooks and the exams and the quizzes here, because this is going to give you a good deep understanding of convolutions. And then it's going to make, once we get to deep learning, it's going to be so, so much easier. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I'll see you soon.